Hello and welcome to the annual meeting of the Global Future Councils 2019. Uh, this is an issue briefing uh, where we are talking about the energy transition. Specifically, how can we fire up the energy transition? So, um, between 2014 and 2019, those were the warmest years on record, according to the World Meteorological Organization. So, how can the transition from a fossil-based um, economy move to a zero-carbon um, economy? How can this be accelerated? Now, I'm delighted to be joined by um, Jules Kortenhorst. You are the Chief Executive Officer of the Rocky Mountain Institute, um, based in the USA. And also, Christina lamp uh, you're the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of the Cadenza, um, of Cadenza Innovation, also based in the USA, I'm, I'm correct. Um, I mean, the science is very clear, I think, um, on the need to accelerate a transition to a zero-based economy. Um, where are we at at the moment? I think we talked about, uh, if I'm correct, that we need to half our emissions over the next 10 years. Can you tell us where we are? Yeah, the reality is, Max, we are not on track. Um, the climate crisis is staring us in the face and um, we are not yet deploying the technologies that decarbonize our economy at anywhere near the speed that we're going to need to um, make, uh, bring climate change under control. In fact, the reality is greenhouse gas emissions still continue to rise. And if we have to sort of make that turning point in the next year or so, and then halve emissions over the next 10 years, uh, the speed at which we have to move has to accelerate very dramatically. I think we can even make that uh, even more dramatic to say we are in climate change. Uh, climate's changing now. It's changing. And we are in a position where we have a chance to uh, slow down some of the change and abate so it's not catastrophic. But the data is abundant. We are already in the change. So otherwise we would be blind to the data that surrounds us. In fact, uh, it is um, also true that the general consensus amongst people with access to some level of news are also informed. In fact, as you know, the people of Iceland had this memorial letter to the future just raised this fall, where it says one of our most powerful glaciers just melted, and this is our statement to the future, we know. For the next 200 years, you'll be the judge, but we know. And I think we should take that and let that sink in. We know. And what we do over the next year, the year after that, for the next 10 years and 20 years, really matters. Do we have, do we already have the technology um, to move us to a net zero energy future? I would say we do. Um, basic technologies to decarbonize our electricity system are abundantly available, solar and wind. Energy, technolo energy efficiency technologies have been available for a very long period of time. We also have enough of the integration technologies that allow us to bring these parts of the energy system together. Integration? What, what do you mean by integration technology? Um, people often worry that the sun doesn't always shine, and the wind doesn't always blow. And, and that's true, but we are now able to manage our electricity system in such a way that uh, even with high penetration of variable renewables, we can still ensure that there is a stable supply of clean electricity all the time. Um, but the problem is, it is only recent that these technologies have become cost-effective and Many of the decision makers are still stuck in the old paradigm that these technologies are not cost effective or not yet fully demonstrated and therefore there is a big hesitancy to deploy them at the speed and the scale that we need. Uh, and you believe we have the technology? Absolutely. I think we have actually had the technology for a long time. So many of us have been working on energy friendly technologies for the last 15 years or more. And in fact, there is 
low-hanging fruit that is available to us right now. So a cost-effective technology? Yeah, cost-effective, low-hanging fruit, basically, to offset this potentially catastrophic problem. And yet, if, Such as, for example? Yeah, for example, the heating of this temperature target that we're approaching very rapidly. No, I mean, I'd say such oh, as, as which, which technology, yeah, yeah, of I course. guess. Of course. So there are uh, wonderful opportunities to take, for example, old technology and pair it gradually with new technologies. So you can take examples of, for example, peak shaving. You can do that by adding other types of energy generation and slowly phase that in as you basically generate electricity and you need to phase out old assets. Or you can put in battery storage today. You can put in microgrids today. That technology exists. With the onset of data and digitalization, you have access to data in a way which was not possible even 10 years ago. You have public awareness on how you could potentially just get knowledge and change your behavior, which is the maybe easiest technology available. If you know the impact of your behavior, you could change. And yet, the governments matter a lot in this whole puzzle. It's the biggest purchaser of electricity I was going to say, where, where, so where are the... So the information and the opportunity now and what World Economic Forum is doing so beautifully here at this meeting is of course bringing together stakeholders where some people are really good at technology, some people are really good at policy, and we know local, locally that there will not be one solution that fits all. You will have to take the ecosystem into consideration. Well, um, I want to ask you about um, uh, data and renewables, renewable technology, and you some mention, mentioned energy storage. I, um, I want to ask you that later, but. Um, where do, where do you see? I mean, where do you see some of the blockages that are happening now, and where do you see, I guess, the systemic change happening? So, with storage paired with the old paradigm, it's the easiest arbitrage of efficiency. So, it's very inefficient and very contaminating to ramp up peaker plants up and down, for example, in developed systems, where if you bring in battery technology. It loves to work, and you can run the more contaminating fossil fuel at a better operating range, so you don't have the contamination as much. With solar and wind, and with the onset of blockchain technologies, or sharing of nodes and sharing electricity, you have that plus battery storage and this digitalization as a whole new era, and it's ready. It's ready for deployment. Yes, there will be potentially even better technologies in 10 years. And the more we deploy, the more we learn. But we are at a point right now where we have multiple case studies, and we worked on this a lot during last year, and really tried to highlight opportunities in areas where there were really decisions to be made. Should we go with traditional coal? Should we look at oil? Should we look at gas? Or should we look at solar with battery storage? And the renewables won in cost, which is just remarkable. And, and so are we talking about... Oh, go on. Yeah, coming back to this, this question of where are the blockages, the um, existing industries are, of course, concerned about the massive transition that they're going to have to make. And hesitancy, uh, fixed assets that are currently in place, things in which we have already invested that have to transition, uh, are significant barriers. We also have to recognize that this transition will bring about uh, significant social change. Uh, jobs will be created in the new industries, but jobs will also get lost in the old industries. Coal miners will not have their jobs in the way they currently have uh, 20 years from now. Um, and, and so that social transition is another barrier to change, and we have to manage that transition in a just and fair uh, manner. And then finally, uh, governments have committed under the Paris Agreement to be part of this transition. But policymakers don't always have the courage to put out bold regulations um, well in advance of knowing precisely how we're going to get there. We're starting to see more of that happening, but it is still a big hurdle for policymakers to say, we're going to make this transition, we don't precisely know yet how we're going to get there, but we'll put the goals out there so that industry finds the pathways of innovation and, and the solutions of the future. So industry, 
uh, social transition in government we all have to accelerate. I, I mean, both of you, um, I imagine, in, in, a, in your work, speak to policymakers. You, talk, you talked about the um, about needing sort of courage to make this change. What, what do you think um, will make people courageous to, uh, to actually make these rapid changes? Yeah, um, I think one reality we are currently facing, as Christina was already saying, we are facing the impacts of climate change today. And so the more we're starting to look at the reality of climate impacts, the more policymakers will find courage because they'll start to see the impacts. Second thing that helps is the, the leadership and the courage of the young generation that has been out there on the streets in Europe, around the world, to say, you are playing with our future and we need you to step up. And we've seen it, for example, in the United Kingdom, where the mass mobilization by Extinction Rebellion, school strike, has led the government to pass a law that formally declared a climate emergency. Now, that trend is, I think, spreading around the world in some places more rapidly than in others. Uh, but I, I think we are starting to see more pressure, more grassroots pressure from a younger generation that is very aware of the fact that if we don't address this issue urgently, it will be dear generation that will pay the price. Christina, but it's, but it's even more than that, which is, which is all true and wonderful, but it's even more. The awareness in the streets is higher this year than it was even last year. The um, opportunity to, to when I go to a normal party or just meet with friends is now they ask, what can I do? That didn't happen last year. So are you, do you think the change is, is a sort of linear change? Or, or oh, do you it's think, exponential. Do, I think it's exponential. I think the more people know in general of success stories, so when you know a person who drives an electric car instead of a fossil fuel car, that person loves to talk about that car. When you have a friend who just installed solar on their home, they love to talk about it. And these become more and more frequent and less and less scary. These are their calculations behind it, how you can survive it and how you can monetize it and what the experience is. And yeah, it actually worked. It wasn't so hard. And all these stories are helpful. And then, of course, the wonderful opportunity to be a little scared when you see things happen or if it happened to you, it scares you a lot. So the more we come closer to these ranges where you have catastrophic impact, the more sense of urgency you will feel. So I think both of those are happening. There's a level of inspiration and a level of devastation at the same time. So if we're having this conversation, say, in five years' time, what do you think we'll be talking about? What, yeah, what will be the sort of barriers or challenges then? So To both of you. I guess. Yeah, yeah, so I think that there's a number of things that will dramatically accelerate as a result of these non-linear, these exponential growth curves in new technology and deployment. I feel very confident that five years from now, all around the world, uh, the most cost-effective way of power generation uh, will be solar and wind. We will be rolling out those renewable electricity technologies all around the world. And in some ways, we'll feel confident that electricity is the source of energy, clean electricity is the source of energy for the future, where we will probably still be challenged and where we might find it harder to see enough progress five years from now is in those parts of our economy where we don't have the complete answer yet. For example, uh, uh, aviation, uh, the, the, the airline industry, we don't exactly have all the technologies yet at our fingertips to decarbonize uh, the airline industry and it is a very significant growth sector. Uh, similarly, shipping. How are we going to decarbonize shipping? Will ships sail on, will ships be powered by uh, hydrogen or clean ammonia instead of marine diesel? Because ships obviously like, uh, like power stations, that's a long investment cycle, that's a long development cycle. Absolutely. This needs to be happening now. And, and if we don't figure out these technologies relatively quickly, we'll be building the wrong types of ships, we'll be buying the wrong types of airplanes for far too long. 
a lot of this is about changing over uh, assets that all have a long lifetime, and the sooner we can get to the point where those decisions are all pointing to um, the right solutions of the future, the better. That's not enough on its own, right? We will also have to deal with some of the infrastructure of the past. Uh, we need to close down coal-fired power plants more quickly than we had originally envisioned, even coal-fired power plants that were built more recently. And that's going to be a difficult transition because those plants might not be fully depreciated, and yet we have to stop burning coal produce electricity that's very where the, quickly. That's where the pains, you know, the... Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and to build on Jill's point, it is very important that we recognize that these are not local decisions. We live on one planet and we are all impacted. So while the decision might be made in a local jurisdiction, we all care and we should all try to help make the best possible decisions. That's why stories where we have done something differently with less environmental impact really matters. They have to be told and they become all of our stories. Uh, one more mega effect five years from now is social impact. I actually think that uh, there is an enormous amount of pressure starting with you holding yourself accountable and your friends holding you accountable. So I think we'll see a little bit of behavioral change in this time. And we have new markets that are kind of not part of the, the lens really for how we manage energy associated with this wonderful upside with digitalization and data. Big data consumes lots of energy. This is a new technology platform where we have every opportunity to do this right. We can set the policy right, we can allow for technical uh, solutions to be applied, they exist. We just got to put that into the sphere of awareness. And it is up to us right now to be on our game on both those social change, old infrastructure, new deployments, and new technologies. On, on technology, where, for example, do you see <clears throat> battery technology, maybe, or, or yeah, um, energy storage technology in, um, say, five years' time? Mm. Yeah, so we have had uh, a long run with successful energy technologies in portable power and now emerging into electric vehicles. Uh, that same type of technology is available for energy storage, especially when you have high cost arbitrage between, so basically the developed countries where you can do peak to off peak. There are other solutions that are coming in with multiple chemistry. So I know there have been a lot of debates in what elements actually matter the most. So lithium ion will take a lion's share in the near future. And there are multiple uh, anode, the ion basically is lithium, right? But you have multiple cathode counter metals that it can sit in. So it doesn't have to be just one or two. In fact, the whole first row transition metals can participate. And we have lots of options for how we formulate that. The key is we have 30 years of experience on how to design a battery to a given application. So if we recognize that different regions have slightly different application spaces and different applications itself, that a car is a little different than a house, is a little different than an industrial park, and it matters where they sit in the geography, you also have some flavors of this. But of course, the more we define the problem, we're incredibly innovative, and in fact, we have more scientists and engineers alive today than when we combine the history of before. So we have a chance to really take what we know today, deploy it where it makes sense very quickly, and help make it make sense, and then do incremental improvements and step change for the long run. We have to do all of those. On, on, on battery technology, for example, I mean, we're talking you know, at the moment, we're talking rare earth metals, and, and that in itself is a finite resource, which comes with its own social and environmental costs. Um, so rare earth, not so much in lithium ion. So you have okay. very normal metals. You have iron, you have manganese, you have so basically very, very normal metals. So that's not a rare earth technology at all. So just okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Clear. Yeah. But I think one of the other exciting aspects of the de development of uh, battery technology is the reduction in cost. We're mm -hmm. going to see batteries at price levels uh, 60, 70 percent uh, below where they are now in uh, order of magnitude five years. 
And if you think of the implication of that, uh, an electric car that now is still a little bit more expensive than a traditional internal combustion engine car, in five years will in fact be cheaper up front than a car with a combustion engine. You don't have to buy fuel, your maintenance is less, uh, it's easier to, to, to fill up that car, to charge it at your house or your pla place of work. So suddenly the world become the paradigm completely shift where, where a car that is cheaper upfront and cheaper in use becomes the obvious choice for every consumer. So I think we're going to see a dramatic acceleration in that arena as well. And that's such an awesome example because we used to look at EVs, so electric vehicles, from a platform of fossil fuel cars, but we had to retrofit batteries into that platform. Today, there is no modern car company designing a car like that. So in fact, the footprint to making an electric vehicle is smaller. The efficiency use of that electricity that is in the battery to actually propel the car forward is higher. And we design it like a skateboard. You just have a platform, you stack the batteries, and in some cases, the batteries can have dual functions. They can help you from impact, they can help you from collision, you basically power up multiple functions differently. So it's a whole new concept. Um, I just want to if um, just want to check if there are um, are any questions from the floor. Um, wait, 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 wait oh, one, yeah. we, can, we can't we can't hear you. Do you have a question? No, no, no. So just keep talking about EV. Uh, okay, <laughs> okay. So keep keep talking about electric vehicles. Right. Okay. Um, I would also like to point out that there is one other exciting development that is going to push this transition forward much more rapidly. And that is the fact that financial institutions around the world are starting to come to grips with the challenges and the risks associated with climate change. And financial institutions, more than many other businesses, are good at understanding risk. And so they see physical risks associated with climate change, the extreme weather events, the sea level rise. They also see the transition risks associated with a new paradigm coming, a new energy reality emerging. And as financial institutions therefore start to worry about their investments, their, the loans they have given, the equity investments they have made, they are going to be a force pushing this transition rather than holding this transition back. And that is a new situation that was not there even two, three years ago, when financial institutions were still uncertain about the energy technologies of the future. Now they are starting to become enthusiastic advocates of those technologies and will see financial momentum shifting very quickly in the direction of a low carbon economy. Christina, yeah. I want to ask you yeah. about the financing of this. Where... I think that's true. So in addition to the investment proposition, you also have the insurance of the insurance of the asset. And what is actually insurable five years from now? So if we take in consideration the social change and awareness with risk and how we judge risk, that has all of a sudden a whole new meaning. It's just very interesting. We, it's normally when we look at technology history and deployment and uh, paradigm shifts, it's very difficult to forecast when you are at an onset of a shift. It's very easy once you're 80% through. When you're... We are at that onset and uh, we smile. We have in our working groups uh, some of the best analysts in the world and we joke with them every year because we see them frequently that their forecasts are constantly and have been for the last 10 years underestimating the impact in the near term. So you think this is very much in the world's ball, um, in the in the world um, the world's boardrooms, I guess. The... I think that we overestimated in the early 2000s how clean tech would come in, how quickly it would come in, um, and then overinvested a little bit into new innovation, and then a lot of the early stage investments got out, which kind of made everybody a little bit disappointed. Today, I think we're under-investing potentially against the opportunity. And I think that there is real fear in many of the established players today in their boardrooms of missing out, but not being sure exactly what to bet on. And I think it's, it's not that hard in some ways. It is basically an energy transition. It's happening. And it's happening for both social and technical reasons.
that were not available 10 years ago. So Max, in some ways, you hear us laying out two narratives side by side. On the one hand, there is this incredible urgency of climate change and a real worry how we're going to deploy the technologies of the future at the speed that is necessary in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% over the next 10 years. And on the other hand, there is real excitement about the promise of those technologies, about the fact that those solutions are now profitable, that they work, and that we can actually make this transition. And the question is, can we do it fast enough? Can we make this transition happen at the pace that is necessary, such that 10 years from now, we have indeed reduced greenhouse gas emissions yeah. by about 50%. In a word, can we? Um, I am by nature an optimist, uh, and I think uh, we therefore should hold on to the idea that we have to apply hope uh, to that uh, opportunity. Christina? It's looking very difficult in my mind. Um, it will take extraordinary sense of urgency in this year, next year, to make that happen. Uh, and if we are able to do it, we have prosperity for a lot of people. If we don't, there will be some of the weakest on our planet that will suffer greatly. I have one final question um, uh, to both of you. Um, uh, Christina, I'll, I'll ask you first. Are, um, are emerging markets, are they, um, are they leapfrogging to new, to new energy technologies? Can you see that? Yeah. Absolutely. They have the opportunity. And if they, they have, have the opportunity or they're doing it, you can uh, see it I think now. if they have the they have the opportunity, stop. And then if they have access to data at the point of decision, we see almost all the time that they make the choice for more sustainable technology coming into their societies. And this is where uh, I just want to reconnect with an earlier point that we made, which is this is everybody's care. This is everybody's impact and we all own this together so it is not really good enough anymore to sit in a in a good wealthy environment and say those guys are so far away we are all impacted and therefore the call to action is much louder now than it was 10 years ago we are running out of this time frame Jules. Yes, emerging markets are definitely leapfrogging. Um, we can um, name statistic after statistic that is indicative of the speed at which uh, this transitioning is, transition is happening in uh, emerging markets as well. China is by far and away the largest economy in terms of deploying renewable technologies, in terms of electric vehicles. Uh, the speed at which that country is moving in the right direction is quite astounding. But it's not just China. It is places like Chile and Morocco and Ethiopia and India. Uh, all around the world, uh, developing countries are starting to realize that uh, the opportunities in the new energy economy are significant and that the cost of renewables is now lower than the cost of fossil fuels. And they want to be part of that uh, emerging future just like they wanted to quantum leap over the landline telephone to the mobile telephone, uh, we, we see that same transition happening uh, in, uh, in energy as well. Jules, Christina, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.